these guys, what do you think about it? Are they not amazing? Every time I hear them, I hear little nuances and little things in their voices that are amazing. And I just love that. So tonight, guys, we're going to dig back into the book of James. And we're in chapter 2, going through verses 1 through 13. And you guys know that how we have been taking our time and, and going through everything. We're going to continue to do that tonight. And we're going to pick up on part two, starting at number six on your notes. Now, we started last week with bringing notes and having them. And I don't know where they wound up last week when we left. We had some left, and I was going to make some copies. I don't know where they went. So uh, that is going to be a little irrelevant to you. But we're going to start on point six tonight. But the point that we're going to make tonight in this verse is that God has chosen those who are poor. You know, I never knew when we were kids that we didn't have much. <clears throat> I just didn't. I knew that mom liked to sew, I thought, and that uh, McCall's patterns was her buddy. And she would cut pattern after pattern after pattern. And she had drawers full of these patterns. And I remember when I got old enough to, to look at fashion other than blue jeans and a t-shirt. And I remember that my mom made my dad and I leisure jackets that were matching. So he had his mini-me. And it was, uh, it was rough. But uh, we never went without. One thing we always had in our family was love. Have you ever been down on your luck? You ever been in a place where you just didn't have enough? Have you ever been found wanting? Have you ever been hungry? Have you ever been thirsty? Being poor does not necessarily mean that we do not have because we don't have a lot of money. There are people that don't have a lot of money that are extremely wealthy. Can I get an amen on that? Because family is the most important thing outside of salvation that we can have in this life. I remember one time I was asked by one of the, the big wheels out at Nissan where I worked. He asked me a question. He said, Howie, how come you're not putting in for these supervisor jobs? And I remember telling him, asking him, I said, you want me to tell you the truth or you want me to lie to you? He said, I want you to tell me the truth. I said, your priorities are Nissan, Nissan, Nissan. I said, my priorities are God, family, Nissan. I said, because if you lose Nissan, you got nothing. If I lose Nissan, I still got my family and my God. If I lose my family, I still got my God. And I'll never lose my God. There's a lot to be said for that. And as he walked away and he bowed his head, he said something under his breath, and it was these words. There's a lot to be said for family. So I'm asking you today, have you ever done somebody a favor or done something for somebody simply out of the goodness of your heart? Have you ever done that just because you felt it was the right thing to do? I guess I'm that guy that when somebody pulls up somewhere and they need money or they're hungry or whatever, I guess I've got a sign on me because people just flock to me that are in need. I was getting some gas Friday and a guy pulls up in a truck and asked me if I could just give him a couple of bucks for gas to get to Clarksville. He left his billfold in the hotel room. Of course, you know, we all know stories, right? And his boss told him, he said, I can wire money to the hotel. And he had two little boys in that truck. And he had a bunch of equipment in the back of it. He said, mister, I'm telling you, I left my wallet and I'm just trying to get back to where I came from. When I realized I needed fuel, I went to get my billfold. I didn't have it. 
My first thing was, I'll give you a couple of bucks. Then I thought, no, I'm not going to do that. I said, pull up to this pump and I'll fill your tank up. He tried to get my information. He tried to get a way to give me that money back. And I remember saying these words to him. And I want you to think about this. I said, son, I'm not going to let you rob me. He said, what do you mean by that? And I said, you're not robbing me of a blessing. And he turned his arm up like this right here and he had a cross on his forearm. And he said, amen. He said, I get that. And as he stopped and I went to go around him, he rolls his window down, he's on the phone. He said, man, I'm calling my wife. I'm telling my wife what you just did. That's so awesome. Please let me have your address so we can give you the money. I said, no. I looked on his tag, said West Virginia. Part of my heritage is from that part of the country. Poor people working hard. Mind people. So we choose, God rather has chosen those who are poor. Because we can get something from God that we can't get from money. We can get something from God that we can't even get from family. You know what that is? Peace. The scripture declares that the peace, his peace, surpasses all understanding. The other day I was talking with somebody and they were talking to me about some things that were concerning them and they were, they were looking at some stuff and they were studying and they were researching and they were digging into the word and they asked me, can you meet with me so we can talk? I said, sure. Wound up spending two hours sitting and talking about the Bible. Guys, the most important thing you can do for anybody is give them your time. Money can be made. Time can never be recovered. Amen? Let's keep going. The poor are special and precious to God. Often, it is the poor in this world who are the richest in faith and spiritual gifts and who in their need cry out most intensely to God in sincere hunger for his presence, mercy, and help. I remember not long ago, I was laying in my bed and I'd been up really late. I think it was like 5 o'clock in the morning before I ever got to bed. And I'd been out and had to uh, go and visit with someone. And I came home, and I, it's one of those kind of things. You think you're so exhausted that you're just going to fall asleep. And when you lay down, you just can't go to sleep. You ever been there? And I, I, I got up out of the bed, and I, I went to use the restroom. And before I could get back from the restroom to my bed, my knees buckled. And I'm like, and I felt something in my left lower back. And I went to my bed, and before I could get halfway between there, going to the side of my bed just to make it to my bed, I was immediately covered in sweat. And I was having a kidney stone. I was giving birth. <laughs> so girls, the three of you young ladies who are expecting in this room, bless your heart. That's all I'm going to tell you. And I remember picking up the phone. Now listen, I'm trying to show you something here. When we're in need, if I don't have my God to call out to, who am I going to call? Somebody said Ghostbusters, I'm sure. <laughs> I know somebody said Ghostbusters. But who am I going to call? Who can I call that can stop that pain? Now I could call Susan, she could give me a shot. <laughs> but that's going to be temporary because sooner or later that's going to wear off and with my past I would rather not put that kind of substances in my body and start that process again by any means but I'm going to say this to you and I want you to hear it loud and clear I picked the phone up and I called my mama and I said mama and she said when I said mama she said baby what's wrong Something about a mama knowing, isn't it? She said, baby, what's wrong? And I said, mama, I'm hurting. I'm in a lot of pain. And I said, pray for me. And she started to pray. And as she started to pray, it started to clear things up. And I, my pain started to go away. And as my pain went away, she got ready to hang up, and when she got ready to hang up, 
it came back. I said, Mama, don't go pray. I kept her on the phone for almost 30 minutes. And I mean, she was praying. My mama ain't no joke. She said, Howie, I want to hang up and I want to call some people and I want them to pray. And I said, okay, call them. And I laid in that bed and I was writhing in pain. And I could feel it moving through my body. I could feel it coming around my body like you take the back of a knife and just slow drag it. It felt wonderful. I want to do it three or four more times. <laughs> That's a lie. But I remember her saying, where's your oil? You may not believe in that, and that's okay. But I had a bottle of oil sitting beside my bed, and I reached over and I grabbed it. She said, put it where it's at. And I rubbed on it, and I started praying. She was praying. She called me back, and believe it or not, that pain subsided. Now, why am I saying this to you tonight? Why is this important? Because no amount of money could have taken that pain away the way that it was taken away. Now, could I get it to numb? Could I have, have gotten medication? Could I have gone to the hospital? Could I have had surgery? Yes. But God is able to do things in our lives in ways that we can't imagine because most of the time, we don't take the time to call out to him. We don't take the time to ask him. We don't feel good. We take a pill. And it's, it's what we do. It's the nature of who we are and where we are in our society today. But I'm telling you, those that don't have the ability to do that, where do they get it? They call on God. And I just encourage you to do more of that today than you ever have. And I promise you the day is coming when you're going to have to do it. Because things are not going to be available. You'll see. Okay, Robert. For whatever reason... Okay. There we go. All right. Many men were discriminated against because of their faith and race. They were being oppressed and taken advantage of in court by the elite. James says that they are discriminating against others among them who are less fortunate. That takes us right to number seven, which is the rich tend to blaspheme the name of Christ. Why? When a person doesn't need anything, why do they need God? When a person has everything, why do they need God? When we have it all, why do we need God? The answer to that is we don't. We don't need God if we have it all. But it's in those times when we have nothing left that we can call on God, and he'll hear us. Those who trust in riches in themselves take every occasion to put down faith in Christ and thus blaspheme his name. If you don't believe it, look around today. I've watched child after child go to college and come back from college, and you don't know who you're talking to. They've come back with some of the craziest ideas that I've ever heard in my life. I mean, just nuts. Why? Because the way that they, we have turned our educational system is, is away from God and more to man. Look how great we are. That's old. It's superstition. It's not real. It doesn't work. And they've tossed it to the side like it's nothing. Now, do we need education? Yes. Absolutely. Absolutely. We have to have education. That's what makes us more intelligent than the next guy. There's nothing wrong with that. But guys, if we can't put it on the scale and find out what the truth is, we got a problem. And if you don't study this right here, you will not know what that truth is. You got to put this in. This has got to be the filter that all that information pours through so that you find out what the truth is. Amen? Let's keep going. Sadly, many Christians have been more di uh, disposed to treat the rich with respect and attention while ignoring their poor Christian brethren. And Robert said it this evening when we got started up, the giving in this church is amazing. The way that we help people, the way that we do for people, 
that are less fortunate than us is utterly amazing. And you're to be commended for that. Number eight is this. We are to fulfill the royal law. You remember Jesus is talking and he says, I did not come to do away with the law, but to fulfill the law. What law was he referring to? That law that he's referring to is in James and it says, requiring us that we love our neighbors as ourselves. Why is that? The Bible says that God's speaking, Jesus Christ is actually speaking, and he says, what should I do? He said, love your neighbor as yourself. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, and soul, and your neighbor as yourself. You see, it's the simplicity of it, guys. We want to look at it as being complicated. We want to look at it as being difficult. It's not difficult. Just love the next guy. Treat him with respect. Honor them if you can. I got a neighbor that I come home from time to time, and on my back door, there's going to be a little bag with some vegetables in it. And every time I lately, I've realized what a blessing that man is. And I know he's got some issues, and he's got some problems, and that's all right, too. But I now have got to where when I get those vegetables, I ask God to bless that man. Because God blessed the earth that he put those seeds in to create that, did he not? The Bible says he lets it rain on the just and the unjust. And he turns around and blesses me. So why should I curse him? I should bless him and I should love him the same way I would anybody else. If we comply with the spirit of this law and we do all that is required in our dealings with our fellow man, treating them according to their real worth, it means we are not influenced by what they have or do not have. It's easy to walk up to somebody who's got a lot of money and ask them for something. No, it's not. Have you guys ever noticed that it's just the opposite? That people that are wealthy, people give them things all the time. Have you, seriously, have you ever noticed that? You ever watch TV? People are trying to cut them slack and give them a break, and they got more money than anybody in the whole place. Probably as much money as everybody combined. Why is that? Why is it that they'll walk by the guy that don't have anything on the sidewalk and not give him nothing, him sitting there with nothing to eat, shoes not half done, clothes tore all to pieces, and walk in and just start handing money to people because they recognize them? It's a messed up thing, isn't it? Now listen. I'm not beating up on people that's got money. But there's a spirit that goes with things. When we learn that money's a tool and money is not to be worshipped, not only will it change us, but it'll change our financial situation. And that's a true statement. When we learn how to use things that God has given us, instead of expecting it to come, then it changes our perception and the way we deal with things. Amen? Number nine, God is the judge we will face over our actions or inactions. Now that right there, guys, it may sound simple, but I'm nobody's judge. How many people in this room been judged by somebody? Be honest. Had somebody else to judge you, look down their nose at you, beat you up for wherever you come from, or, or you don't talk like everybody else. I remember coming from the south, moving up north. Man. Come over here and talk for us. Hi. He said hi. What? It's the way you said hi. And when I lived up north for a while, when I came to the south, and I said, hey, can I get a pop? A what? You mean a Coke? No, I don't like Coke. Well, which Coke do you want? I'm like, what do you mean which Coke do I want? Well, we got Dr. Pepper, Sprite, lemonade. Tea. <laughs> Coke is Coke. It's a cultural thing, right? But sometimes we get caught up in stuff, and we become cliquish, and it lets us feel better about being us because we can look at somebody else in a negative way. I'm just being real here. We have people that look down on people because of whatever. I'll never forget 
when I was a kid, actually living here in Gallatin. My dad was pastoring a church here in town, and back before Becky and I got married, I remember my baby sister coming up pregnant. And I remember how people treated her because she wasn't married. And I remember how it hurt me because of what they were saying about my sister. I wasn't a preacher back then, so I didn't have a problem telling them what I thought. Of course, Daddy heard about it, and then I got in trouble on the other side, but anyway. How many of you like somebody to stand up for you? Just stand up for you. When you're getting beat down, how many of you like somebody just to stand up? Or just have somebody to step in the way to slow it down just a little bit? You're getting what I'm talking about tonight? And so if we can love our neighbor as ourselves, we can stand in the gap for people who are being wounded, who are being damaged, who are being broken, and just let them heal. The motto of this church is bring, heal, train, and sin. Why? Because nobody in this room has not been hurt. Everybody's been hurt by somebody. Everybody's been hurt because of something they've said or something they've done or something they've not done, actions or inactions. Everybody. And what I know to be a fact is that when somebody stands up for me and takes up for me, it feels good because I feel like I have worth. And I've explained this to you before, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go through this illustration again. It's like a person who goes to a water slide and they lose their bathing suit. Three things are going to happen. One of three things. Number one, everybody's going to be gawking. Number two, everybody's going to be laughing. And number three, somebody either will or will not render aid with a beach towel, right? And you've got a choice and you've got an option if you're the person with the beach towel. You can either hold that up and look on that person's shame while you're trying to protect them. Everybody with me? Or you can lay that towel across your shoulders and stand in front of them and look at all the people that are trying to look at this person while they're calling you everything to try to get you out of the way. You guys getting that? When somebody's hurting, when somebody's broke, when somebody's down, be a shield to them. For nothing more than letting them get themselves together and become whole again. Amen. We can throw a rock through a glass window or a baseball through it. Either way, the glass is broken. There are certainly different levels of sin as well as punishments. Yet when the law is broken, it is broken. God has given the believer liberty, but that liberty is not a license to sin. I remember when I was a boy, we were living in a place called Lana, Maryland. It's about 20 minutes outside of D.C. And me and another boy, we were just bored. And we didn't have a ball, so we were just throwing a pop bottle at each other. And we just tossing a pop bottle. And we would take a step back each time we threw it to see how far we could get and still catch that bottle. Well, I remember being a pretty good ways away from him. And I laid back into that bottle and I threw it. And it went right through the church window. Right before service. <laughs> my, my daddy come flying out of that church building. And he said, what happened? Me and that boy was standing there. I said, that guy done it. <laughs> and there was a guy probably a good half a mile jogging down the road. <laughs> and, and my dad took off and got about five steps. He was going to run that guy down. And he stopped and he said, wait a minute. <laughs> he said, there ain't no way that guy could have got that way, that far away that quick. He turned around and he looked at me. I had my head down. You know how kids, they, they, they guilt their own selves. I had my head down. <laughs> and he said, son. Why did you do that? I said, we were just playing ball, Dad. I'm sorry. He said, no, why did you tell me that guy did it? He said, if I'd have caught him, I'd have beat the brakes off of him. But isn't that what we do? 
we do something, we mess up, instead of standing up and saying, hey, I messed up. Let's work on it. Let's fix it. Let's get better. We try to put it on somebody else or blame somebody else. But that level of sin, the law is broke if it's broke. Now here's where it gets cool. Watch this. We are not competitors for God's grace, but co-receivers. If we want judgment, all we have to do is bring judgment against our brother. Hold him up for sentencing, and the same judgment we are judging him will come to us. Sin brings judgment, while repentance and forgiveness, watch this, brings mercy. Which one you want, judgment or mercy? I'm just saying. Let's keep going. Number 10, the man who keeps the whole law except one is guilty of all. Has anybody ever heard that? Anybody ever heard of that before? Now, this is where it gets a little crazy because we misunderstand what it means when it talks about this. And I want you guys to have some clarification on it tonight. James is not saying that if we break one commandment, we have broken them all. He is saying that we are guilty of breaking the commandments no matter which one we've broken. Does that make sense? We're just guilty of it. What are we guilty of today? Is every person in this room completely, utterly innocent? I'm just saying. <laughs> I watched Zane last weekend. Becky had him. And that's my little grandson. And he's not supposed to be grabbing telephones and remotes and keys and stuff like that. And he'll walk over and he'll pick up a remote like this and he'll go, See, I'm trying to help you. No, you ain't supposed to touch that. But see, that's sneaky, ain't it? He picked that dude up and go like it. You can't beat that. <laughs> well, if it was Trey or Travis, yes, you can. <laughs> but that's my son's. That's not my grandson. There's a different level there. We can't play that same rules there. So is this making sense? Are you guys getting this tonight? I think this is good. Salvation is not gained or lost in keeping or breaking commandments. What? However, we are judged according to the righteous standards of God's word. You got it? Sin is not gained or lost in keeping or breaking the commandments. What do you think mercy is for? What do you think grace is for? But is it a license for us to go out and do whatever we want? No, it is not. And that's the beauty of the grace of God, isn't it? Paul teaches that lawbreakers are those who walk according to the flesh. We've been given the Holy Spirit as a means of obeying the righteous requirements of the law. Which are what? Love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, and soul, and your neighbor as yourself. That's the royal law. That's all you got to hold on to, guys. Am I doing the right thing here right now? I was up in Portland a couple of weeks ago, and I was talking to a pastor friend, and right there where it gets the, the road opens up, to the four lane, well, it's all four lanes now, isn't it? Uh, so down toward uh, Hardee's, Sonic, McDonald's, all that area right there at the junction, a guy comes out of this parking lot over here. I'm in the slow lane. Believe it or not, I was in the slow lane. A guy comes across one lane, two lanes, medium, third lane, and runs me off the road. I was talking to a pastor friend. Y'all would be proud of me. I didn't fuss at him. I didn't push down on the right pedal and try to draft him. I just hit the brakes and I said, Lord, help this man. Now, I want to say something. That's not common for me. <laughs> I'm being honest. That's not common for me. But I've been asking God to help me with that. And all of a sudden, I'm starting to see results of me asking it's not about perfection, guys. It's about the attempt to get better. It's the striving to get better. It's keep working on it. Don't give up. Don't stop. Even if you, Daddy always said, son, you're going to fall. Everybody falls, and it's necessary that you fall. But when you fall, fall forward. So that even in falling forward, you're still gaining ground. Isn't that the way it's supposed to be? We're not supposed to give up anything. There's an old song that says, I went to the enemy's camp and I took back what he stole from me. How many of us have been robbed? 
been robbed of our joy, been robbed of our peace, been robbed of our families, our friendships, been robbed. The Bible says we don't have it because we don't ask for it. The Bible also says that God will restore what the canker worm has eaten. And he will put back what's been stolen if you'll just stop and ask him to. And that's the beauty of it. We must also keep in mind the context of the entire epistle of James. Guys, if you don't get anything tonight, please get this. This entire book, the entire book of James is in pursuit of one thing, and that is spiritual maturity. No one is a habitual law, no, no one is a habitual lawbreaker can be called mature. That should be that is a habitual lawbreaker, can be called mature. And we've talked about this before. If you, we've asked this question, do you have to sin? Is it necessary that you sin? And everybody answers, yeah, everybody's going to sin. Okay, so let's say you sin 20 times a day. Some people are like, hmm, can we go a little, can we raise that little bar a little bit more? Some people are saying, well, I could probably go 20 times. And we ask the question, just break it down, could you do three times a day? Do the math on something right quick, just saying something. Three times 10 is what? That's 30, right? So if I had 30 violations of the law, now that's in 10 days. If I had 30 violations of the law and I stood in front of a court and I had 30 speeding tickets that I had gotten in 10 days, do you think I would still have a driver's license? I'm, I'm just saying. Probably not, right? What if I had 30 DUIs in 10 days? I'm just asking the question, guys. Is this making sense? Help. <laughs> <laughs> and that's what happened when a little guy dumps a box of crayons. Hell, I get it. That's awesome. That's what we all need to do when we get in trouble. If we, if we would do that and add Jesus right to the end of that, we'd have it made. There's your illustration for tonight. We're done. <laughs> so we're on our path to do what? Become spiritually mature. And that's the key to all of it. Some of us move quicker than others. Some of us move turtle speed. Some of us move basically in neutral, and we're stuck. But that doesn't make us wrong. It makes us human. And that's the God part that can get involved and help us in those situations. Amen? Let's keep going. Number 11, Jesus declared the second great commandment to be, Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. He declared that that would be the second great commandment. James calls this the royal law. It sums up man's responsibility to his neighbor. He who fulfills it loves all men. And, uh, and look upon, or look, what did I just say? He who fulfills it will love all men and look with contempt on none. How about that? Just love somebody. It's not the desire of God, God to deal harshly with anyone. He's not willing that anyone should perish. He is ever ready to forgive and bless where sin is recognized and confessed. Bam! That's it. All we got to do is say, you know what? I messed up. God, help me with this. And you know what? He's going to help you. And you know what you're probably going to do? You're probably going to mess up in that same area again. And when you do, what the devil's going to do is he's going to say, see, I told you. I told you you couldn't do it. I told you you weren't good enough. I told you you really weren't saved. I told you God didn't really love you. I told you that God didn't care. I told you there's no church that wants you. I told you. That's why you keep doing that. That is a lie. It's a lie. Because everybody makes mistakes. You got insurance on your car. Why? In case you make a mistake or somebody else makes a mistake, like coming across five lanes of traffic. You don't have insurance because you're going to have a wreck or you're going to have a problem with your car. You have insurance in case you do. But we treat grace like it's we've got to. We don't have a choice. And that is the lie. We do have a choice in everything. No matter what it is, we have a choice. Amen? One scoop or two. You got a choice. 
right? Everybody has a choice. Let's keep going. Number 12, we are to speak and act like God. We are to speak and act like God. We must speak and act from the perspective of those who will be judged by God and the law that gives freedom, i.e. the law and love of God poured into our hearts by the sacrifice of Jesus on the cross. God will condemn all showing of favoritism for it transgresses the law of love. I had a, a guy I was talking with the other day and he came to me out of the courts and I was spending some time with him and I said, dude, I'm gonna tell you something and you may think this is crazy, but I love you and there's nothing you can do about it. And he said, well, that, that's pretty crazy. I said, but I just made a choice. And he said, yeah, you did. At the end of our conversation, he said, you know, I have been through marriage counselors. I've been through therapists. And I've had nobody make more sense than you did in one hour than in all the time I spent with all those other people. Now, that makes me feel good because it makes me think I'm something, right? And when I say that, if I say it the wrong way, you may think that I'm saying that I'm something. But I'm going to tell you, it's the God that's in me that frees people from getting stuck. Because I'm not smart enough to come up with these things that frees these people. You getting it? And if you ever get in that place where you say something or you do something and you go like that and scratch your own head and go like, where did that come from? You need to understand that that came from God. He was helping you right there. That's what the Holy Spirit does if we'll allow him to work in our life. Plain and simple. Just help the next guy. I've got a thing that I try never to do. I try to never take the next rung on the ladder unless I pull somebody up beside me. Because I have found out the hard way. You climb a ladder by yourself and you make one wrong move, it's a long fall. But if you've brought people with you and you go to fall or you go to slip, somebody will help you. Somebody will catch you. Somebody will grab you. Anybody seen the, the video thing on Facebook about daddy catches, ninja daddies? You know, daddy's got, got some real good skills when it comes to catching babies. Sometimes not, I'm just saying. But it's amazing to watch those, those instantaneous snatches and grabs and catches. But that's what I'm talking about. And the Lord says this, it is him, he, himself that guides your steps David talks and he says, God, let my feet be like hind's feet, no, like, like the feet of a, a deer or a goat, so that I don't slip and I don't fall. And if I do slip and I fall, catch me. And that's the thing about God. If we lean on him, we keep him close to us, how far away is he? When we make that mistake, when we slip, when we fall, he catches us. And that's what makes it even better. In all our conduct, we are to act under the influence of the truth that we will stand before him to be judged. This law of liberty or rule by which true freedom is secure, man is not only ex emancipated from one sin, but from all. So it's not we're, we're asking God to forgive us of one individual sin. But when we ask God to forgive us of our sins, he forgives us of, gives us of our sins. Not just nitpicks us. Isn't that wonderful? Could you sit down and think about what it would take for you to list every sin you've ever committed and ask God, God, that's stuff I've done for God. Forgive me of those sins. And Thirteen. It is through the finished work of Christ that mercy triumphs over judgment. What Jesus did. Man, when Isaac Obure spoke up here and said, it is finished, that was one of the most amazing sermons I've heard in a long time. But it's through the finished work of Christ that mercy triumphs over judgment. How we treat others is the acid test of our commitment to our God. God may be testing us to see how we will respond. It is for us as believers to respond in kindness, mercy, love, forgiveness and grace our attitude is important here for quickly we often forget 
We forget where we came from, don't we? The merciful man will have no fear at the judgment, having acted according to the law of liberty. Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. And that's where I'm going to stop tonight. I've got a couple more points, but I'm going to go ahead and stop. Guys, I want to thank you all for being here tonight. And I want you to understand that the most important thing that we can do to anybody, for anybody, in any way, is to show them mercy. Even though they don't deserve it, show somebody mercy. Love on them. Care about them. Spend time with them. Daddy always said, some people you can love up close. Some people you got to love at a distance. But love everybody. Amen. I want to bless you tonight. Bow your heads. Father, I thank you for the day. I thank you for your goodness, and I thank you for your mercy. And I bless you tonight, Lord, and I ask you to bless each and every one of those that are here tonight. Watch us and keep us, God. Help us to be men and women, boys and girls, children, Lord, that are worthy to be called Christian, Father, but to act like you and to love people above whatever they've done. Give us the strength that we need. Give us the mercy that we need. And continue to be with us each and every day. Father, I specifically ask that you keep your hand of protection upon all of our law enforcement during this eclipse time. I've been close to a lot of them, Lord, and I've spent time recently with several of them in classes. And There's concerns, Lord, about all this stuff and all these, the craziness that's going on in the world. But I ask you, Lord, to be with us and keep us, protect us. Bless them, firefighters, all of our military, God. Be with them as they watch over us and watch over them as they protect us. We thank you for it all, Lord. Bless this church and every person that's here. In your name, Jesus. Amen. All right, guys, don't forget, August the 27th, make sure that you're at Travis and Melissa's place. It's going to be awesome. We're going to have a good time. And if you need something, talk to Becky. She'll let you get directions. Don't forget also that Nina is in need uh, of moving and also that we need to assemble some desks tomorrow night. Just give me a call. Give me a text. Thank you all for being here. God bless you.